My name is Linda Levy, and I'm the director of the JBC Archives. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this public lecture in the context of the Ruth and David Musher JBC Archives Fellowship. The JBC Archives, which houses the records of JBC since its creation in 105 years ago, is one of the most important repositories of modern Jewish history. Visiting scholars from around the world uh, as do, uh, use our collections, as do publishers, uh, family researchers, museums, uh, curators, filmmakers. Um, uh, we have a very rich collection. I invite, I invite you to look at our wonderful website at archives.jdc.org, and you'll be able to see uh, our names index, our uh, database for our entire collection, uh, online exhibits, our photo collection, and much more. Um, the Ruth and David Musher JDC Archives Fellowship was established with a generous gift from Ruth and David Musher, who are here with us today, um, who are longtime supporters of JDC with deep roots in the American Jewish community and a long-standing commitment to scholarship and research. Uh, and Jewish education. The goal of the fellowship is to enable scholars um, engaged in graduate level postdoctoral or independent research to conduct research in our archives either in New York or in Jerusalem. This is our fifth Ruth and David Musher JBC Archives public program and I want to extend our thanks to you Ruth and David uh, for your generosity and for your uh, commitment uh, to the work that we do. So thank you, thank you so much. Our speaker today, Dr. Jan Lanichek, is the recipient of this fellowship for 2019. Our format is that our speaker will speak for about 45 minutes, and this will be followed by an opportunity for questions um, for about another 15 minutes. I'd like to call on Ruth Musher, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks. Dr. Jan Lenacek is a distinguished historian, researcher, and author. He was born and educated in the Czech Republic and received his PhD from the University of Southampton in England in 2011 in the study of Jewish and non-Jewish relations. After completing a postdoctoral fellowship at UNSW, the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, in 2012, he joined the UNSW School of Humanities, where he is a senior lecturer of modern European and Jewish history. He has also served as a consultant to Yad Vashem, Czech TV, and the BBC. His publications include works on the complex relations between Czechs, Slovaks, and Jews between 1938 and 1948, published in 2013. Arnost Frischer and the Jewish Politics of Early 20th Century Europe, published 2016. The Jew in Czech and Slovak Imagination, 1938-1989, and in collaboration with Hannah Kubatova, Antisemitism, the Holocaust, and Zionism. Dr. Lanachek is currently preparing and editing a volume of scholarly articles on the humanitarian relief programs for Jews incarcerated in ghettos and concentration camps during World War II. Researchers from Australia, America, Canada, and some European countries are participating in this project. And Dr. Car Conrad Kvate, the resident historian of the Sydney Jewish Museum described the project as groundbreaking. It will be the first concise, comprehensive description and analysis 
of humanitarian relief programs organized by governments in exile in cooperation with Jewish organizations and a major contribution from the JDC. The book will document the importance of these efforts for survival of Jewish prisoners during the Holocaust. This afternoon, we have the privilege of hearing Dr. Lanuchet speak on the topic, Sardines to the Ghettos, Relief Food Parcels for Jews in Occupied Europe During World War II. Please help me welcome Dr. Jan Lanuchet. Thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for this very, uh, very kind introduction. Um, I also uh, would like to thank uh, to uh, Ruth and to David uh, Marshall for supporting her research and uh, for bringing scholars to New York for this uh, incredible opportunity to uh, study the, in the archives, uh, but also to, to uh, Linda and uh, Isabel for welcoming me uh, back in New York after uh, eight years uh, and uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to work in the archives uh, over the last uh, two weeks. So uh, the uh, talk uh, I'm, I'm giving uh, is part of uh, a larger project and uh, I was trying to be uh, selective, uh, but also to give a uh, general overview of, of the program, of the, of the programs for aid for Jews during the war, uh, organized by, by JDC, uh, but, uh, by other organizations, and especially by uh, exile uh, governments from London, which is the main topic of, of my uh, research. So, I will start with, uh, with one uh, example, one story uh, from uh, 1944. And um, uh, the man on, on, on the right, uh, Fritz Ullmann, uh, was stationed during the war in Geneva, and um, he was a Jewish activist, uh, a representative of the Jewish, a Jewish agency, who was in uh, regular conta uh, contact with uh, occupied territories, with uh, Jewish communities there, and was able to translate uh, a lot of information about uh, the fate of the Jews uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, he worked together with people such as uh, such as uh, Gerhard Rigner and uh, Richard Lidheim, so very well connected people uh, to uh, Europe. In uh, April, uh, actually in late summer 1944, uh, he uh, received one of many uh, cards uh, that kept uh, landing on his desk. Uh, this one uh, from uh, Hella uh, Hella Konyo, uh, who was. Um, uh, deported to, to Auschwitz from uh, Thessaloniki. And uh, she sent the, uh, she sent the uh, card uh, from um, so-called uh, camp, uh, Arbeitslager labor camp, uh, Birkenau by Neuberun, uh, which is the name that prisoners had to use for the Auschwitz to Birkenau extermination camp. And um, in the letter of the card, which is in the picture on the left, um, uh, she uh, wrote to Fritz, who was kind of family friend, a uh, uh, friend to of, uh, of uh, uh, Hela's uh, parents. And uh, dearest Fritz, uh, Erika and I, Erika is her daughter, uh, have been uh, already twice uh, received sardines from Portugal, and we thank you very much. Um, I have not received any message yet, uh, but that can still change. You can't imagine how happy I was and what kind of help it has been for us. Uh, write to us uh, once too. Um, we wait with longing for every word, for every message. Uh, we don't have to read the whole thing. And uh, Hela was deported from Thessaloniki, and uh, surprisingly, uh, the whole family survived. All four people survived, uh, including two small uh, children. Uh, but there are other questions which uh, I kind of uh, I want to address uh, in the talk and generally in the project that I'm uh, dealing with. Is, uh, I mean, how was it possible that uh, prisoners in Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is a symbol of uh, ultimate death and desolation, received uh, parcels with sardines uh, from, uh, from overseas? Uh, was it a kind of a part of, um, uh, who were the senders? Who was sending those parcels? And then uh, finally, was it part of a kind of larger uh, effort uh, to support the Jews in the camps, or was it just an ad hoc 
uh, initiative uh, by one, one person. Uh, I just, uh, before I move on, uh, more examples which I found recently uh, in the last two days, one here and one in the Jewish, uh, Museum, Museum of Jewish Heritage uh, um, in the Battery Park. Uh, so uh, this uh, list on the left side uh, is a uh, list of uh, uh, people uh, incarcerated in Birkenau, composed by uh, Czechoslovak uh, government in exile, by the consul in Lisbon, to whom he was sending food parcels from Lisbon. And uh, kind of, I was really glad to find um, that uh, uh, Hela Konyo is, uh, is uh, listed there. Uh, so this kind of uh, helps, uh, helps us uh, trace uh, the origin of the parcel. Uh, and the second thing which uh, I agree is not uh, decidedly relevant for this case, uh, but uh, there's a, there is a new exhibition on Auschwitz in the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And, uh, and uh, one item on display is this uh, chess set. Which, is, which the prisoners made in the camp, and they stored it in a sardine can. Uh -huh. So I, kind of, I was incredibly happy to, to find it there. Unfortunately, we don't know if it is part of those sent from Portugal. It could be from anywhere, but anyway, I kind of was really happy to see this connection uh, from, my, from my research, although I admit that uh, I can't prove much. Uh, so uh, what I kind of uh, want to talk about is um, uh, about uh, the project, about its significance, is that uh, uh, such um, aid or programs of, uh, for help the Jews or helping the Jews during the war uh, with the relief parcels is still kind of awaiting its, its historian. It is a major topic, and uh, so far there is no systematic monograph or anthology of, of articles on, on this topic. And in a way, it does. It is in the shadow of other rescue uh, attempts during the war of people like uh, Raoul Wallenberg, um, which of course uh, doesn't mean that it shouldn't be because they were more uh, successful. And I would say, well, I would argue one of the reasons why people uh, don't talk that much about uh, these parcels is that uh, uh, we, I don't, we don't know much about it, and we can't uh, really think that they helped much during the war. Uh, which uh, and we rarely do realize the extent of the help uh, that was uh, sent and uh, possibly also received uh, in those uh, camps. But I would like to say one thing at the very beginning: the number of parcels, or food parcels, or medical parcels, or parcels with clothes that are moving around Europe during the war is enormous. Yeah. People, individuals sending, supporting uh, other individuals inside of Nazi Germany. There are parcels going from one ghetto to another. Uh, there are parcels going from uh, Jews who are not yet being deported uh, and sending them to their relatives and friends who are already in the ghetto. Uh, there are individuals sending parcels from outside of Europe to, uh, to Europe, and uh, etc. Some of them really sent few parcels. There are individuals even inside of Europe who sent tens, hundreds, or even thousands of parcels. There's a family in Denmark. There's one young individual in Prague who sent several tons of food to the Reddingstadt and to Auschwitz, which, uh, however, is not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the help that was reaching uh, those ghettos from outside of, of Europe, because that's uh, my, my research topic. So uh, just a bit of background. Uh, on the food and hunger under the Nazis. And um, we know that the confiscation of uh, food and uh, all related resources uh, was integral part of Nazi policies all over uh, Europe, uh, over conquered territories. And that all access to food was determined uh, based on the racial hierarchy of utopia created by the Nazis, with the Jews being at the very bottom of the imaginary uh, uh, hierarchy or how that. And uh, it is also well documented that uh, hunger uh, very soon uh, spread among, among Jews, especially those who were isolated in uh, the ghettos of Eastern uh, Europe. And, uh, and where they were completely dependent in majority on uh, the rations received from the German administration. And I have uh, one quote from uh, a diarist uh, from uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, Heim Kaplan, uh, who uh, wrote in May 1942 that as many as 60% uh, of uh, the Jews of Warsaw, <coughs> Warsaw uh, are starving in the full sense of the word. 
up to 30 percent are in state of terrible deprivation and hunger, even though it is not apparent from without. And the situation was uh, obviously even worse in, in the camps, where some of the, the Jews were eventually uh, deported, whilst the other ones were sent to places like Treblinka so or uh, Auschwitz uh, to be killed. So in these circumstances, uh, any help, uh, any extra food uh, that the uh, inmates could receive uh, did help in their situation. Uh, there was a lot of uh, black market or smuggling in the ghettos, again, which I don't want to talk about. Uh, but uh, relatives of uh, the Jews who lived outside of Nazi Europe uh, and uh, also Jewish aid organizations are uh, very early informed about uh, the situation in the ghettos. And again, I give uh, one example from uh, two letters uh, sent uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto uh, to Switzerland, uh, cards from the Warsaw Ghetto to Switzerland, uh, save us from a death by hunger. Our parents have died. Please send me a parcel of, of food, love, and, and kisses. So clearly, this deliberate starvation was from the beginning uh, a recognized fact, uh, even outside uh, of Europe during the war. And um, in fact, for a long time, uh, this deliberate starvation was seen as the main policy of the Jews, as the way through which uh, the Germans were destroying the Jewish uh, communities. Uh, so in April 1942, for example, uh, a representative of a Polish jury in uh, mandatory Palestine uh, appealed to uh, the Polish uh, government in exile and the Jewish organizations in America and Britain, quote, uh, an immediate action to save hundreds of thousands of starving Jews in the ghettos from extinction is necessary. Uh, so they believe that uh, if they could support them with food, that it could help them um, in this way to uh, survive uh, at the beginning of the war. And there are many reports or many understanding very, uh, examples that show that uh, people understood the situation in uh, this way. And then we also know that at the beginning of the war, uh, there were um, many uh, humanitarian agencies that operated in the Polish ghettos, especially the JDC, uh, with its uh, office in, in Warsaw, uh, where they distributed tons of food uh, delivered from Romania, uh, Yugoslavia, Slovakia, Lithuania. Uh, there were some smaller shipments uh, posted from, from Switzerland, for example, uh, the uh, uh, Polish uh, Jewish activist uh, Abraham Silberschein and his Reliko organization. And the JDC was also or ran uh, food uh, kitchens in the ghettos and engaged in other forms of social relief for the first two years of the war, two and a half years of the war. And for example, Yehuda Bauer and his main monograph on um, JDC during the war believed that the joint in the first two years managed to save the situation in uh, Polish, Polish ghettos and that it could create conditions for the Jews to survive. But of course, uh, the Nazis soon moved to a different way of, of uh, uh, killing uh, uh, Jewish people uh, at the time. Um, some help at the beginning of the war, and it opens another topic, uh, reached the Jews directly uh, from the United States uh, in the form of relief food parcels being sent by especially Jewish organizations, but I can imagine that by relatives of uh, those uh, people incarcerated in ghettos as well. But the British government, um, uh, already at war with Germany, America still uh, not in the war, um, criticized these activities. And the British, they believed that uh, after the experience of the First World War, when the continental blockade of uh, Nazi Germany, oh, sorry, Germany at the time, uh, helped to uh, defeat uh, Germany in the war, to actually create conditions that it caused internally, that another blockade could help uh, again bring uh, Germany uh, down. And uh, they tried to enforce it from the very beginning and prohibited any import into Europe of any kind of uh, goods or resources that could be used by the Germans in the first place of military equipment, raw material, but also of uh, food, and uh, uh, including uh, food parcels uh, for civilians. <laughs> uh, and also these conditions of economic blockade uh, complicated uh, uh, for example, transfer of money or funds from the United States to Portugal or from elsewhere where people could buy, for example, food and send it to, uh, to um, um, 
Germany, which was also uh, prohibited by the British. Uh, and the British were concerned, quite rightly, that, that the Germans would confiscate the packages, which I guess it was a good assessment. But also they believed that it was the Germans' uh, duty to feed civil population, because it was part of occupation of the rule of, 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 of the war, that if you occupy a country, you have to look after the civil population. Uh, clearly, there was a lot of uh, confusion and incomprehension uh, on, on the side of the Allies for a long time during the war uh, in this context. And there were some exceptions uh, from the blockade, um, but only in cases that uh, it was run by humanitarian organizations, for example, for prisoners of war, uh, based on the Geneva Conventions. So Allied prisoners of war were allowed to receive help. Uh, but the Jews, uh, based on the Geneva, Con Geneva Conventions, were not considered uh, prisoners of war, and uh, they were not allowed to receive food, and the uh, uh, Red Cross were not allowed uh, to uh, monitor the delivery of uh, food to the Jews, who were seen as civil, uh, civilian internees. So uh, they were also, Germans didn't allow any uh, kind of discussion in this context, and the Red Cross didn't challenge uh, the Germans during the war. Uh, over 1941, uh, the British government uh, increased their calls also on the Americans to help enforce the blockade. Uh, and the Jewish organizations, such as the uh, World Jewish Congress or the JDC, um, concerned about the question of dual loyalty, uh, still uh, soon complied with uh, this uh, decision and stopped uh, shipments of uh, food and money to, to Europe. And they even uh, forced the dissenting Jewish organization, for example, the Aguda, which kind of didn't oblige, but they were forced to comply uh, as well. And then, of course, then after the outbreak of the German-American war in December 1941, it was impossible to uh, continue with any shipments uh, at all. Um, so what happened is that uh, in the following uh, months, uh, and I won't go into detail, uh, Jewish activists were trying to appeal to the Allied governments to uh, make concessions to allow them to send at least some food parcels to the ghettos or camps uh, for the uh, suffering Jewish population. And what I find quite ironic uh, in the whole process of this discussion is that the first concession, the first permission to send money and food to uh, the ghettos and camps came at the point when uh, the first reports about mass extermination uh, of the Jews uh, were received in Britain, Britain and America. So as if at the point when they acknowledged that uh, Jews are being systematically killed, they allowed them, uh, the organizations to send food uh, parcels to those Jews. What year was that? Uh, we're talking about 1942. Uh, 1942. Uh, so uh, the, um, the first uh, example is that uh, in June 1942, after the Bund report was published uh, uh, in Britain and America, uh, the uh, British Ministry of Economic Warfare, which was enforcing uh, the blockade, uh, began negotiation with the Board of Deputies of uh, British Jewry with some concessions about uh, food parcel programs for Jews in, in Poland. It took a few months, uh, but eventually in the autumn of 1942, uh, the British allowed the Board to send £3,000, which is about $12,000 in 1942 money, uh, to Portugal, from where they could where they could buy local products and send them to Polish ghettos for Polish Jews. It was only uh, only for Polish and Jews. Uh, nobody else could benefit uh, from from the program. And those three thousand pounds um, could buy at the time approximately eight thousand parcels, half a kilo uh, each, mostly with sardines. As you can see uh, in the um, uh, in the um, previous slides. And uh, the board uh, was uh, cooperating uh, with the Polish government in exile and with their, slide, with, uh, with their uh, consul in Lisbon, uh, Stanislav Szymisek, uh, and also uh, with uh, the JDC representatives in Lisbon, uh, um, especially Joseph Schwarz, who was the head of the European uh, Joint, and Herbert Kaski. Uh, joint uh, represented the board uh, in Portugal because the board, board of deputies didn't have any representative in Portugal. And the, the whole uh, program was funded by uh, British Jewish organizations, especially by uh, uh, Jewish colonization uh, agency. Uh, in December 1942, 
um, the governments in London, Washington, and uh, Moscow uh, finally publicly confirmed their knowledge about the extermination of the Jews, they called it in the um, official declaration of the United Nations from 17 December 1942, the policies of cold blooded extermination. And uh, they also uh, threatened anybody who was involved in the um, policies against the Jews with retribution after the war. It was the only specific promise uh, in the whole uh, kind of uh, declaration. No other rescue or relief measures were uh, promised or uh, officially um, discussed. But secretly, uh, the British and Americans were willing to give more concessions to the food parcel schemes. So, for example, uh, in December 1942, the Joint Distribution Committee received permission to transfer $12,000 a month uh, to Lisbon uh, and send uh, food to Polish Jews, to Jews in Poland, uh, again, only, uh, only in Poland. Uh, almost at the same time, uh, the Czechoslovak uh, government in exile received permission to send uh, the same amount monthly from the British government to Lisbon and use it for Czechoslovak Jews, uh, including those who had been deported uh, from Czechoslovakia to, to Poland. So uh, again, they kind of began to spread as a, as a program, still fairly minor, uh, in each case about 8,000 parcels per month. But there were more concessions uh, that uh, are coming. And finally, the joint, uh, uh, thanks to negotiations of a uh, Czech Jewish emigre community in the, uh, the United States, received another permission from the US Treasury to send uh, the same amount to Lisbon for Jews who were in Czechoslovakia but were not Czechoslovak citizens. So, especially German and Austrian Jews in Theresienstadt ghetto. So, those who were deported to Theresienstadt and were not. Czechoslovaks. So in this case, uh, larger groups could benefit from uh, the program. Uh, there were, in the following two years, and I, again, I don't want to go into detail, uh, new uh, routes or avenues of help uh, developed over time. And over time, the Allies became more approachable and were giving more concessions to these, uh, uh, to these licenses uh, for transfer of money to uh, other countries. Uh, so Sally Meyer, and JDC, representative in, in um, Switzerland um, uh, opened another route from uh, where he was sending food uh, to Central Europe, to ghettos uh, in Central Europe. Uh, then quite large uh, shipments, uh, although I'm not entirely sure if in the end they did go, I haven't been able to find uh, a proof, uh, was opened from Istanbul. Uh, Roy Ben Resnik was a JDC representative in, in Istanbul, and they were trying to send uh, train loads of food to Transnistria, uh, which is nowadays Moldova, Romanian territory uh, at the time. Again, the Resienstadt, uh, but also uh, Poland and other, other places. So there were other examples. And eventually, in very late war, in 1944, December 44, uh, Laura Margolis, uh, JDC, representative uh, visited Stockholm and they tried to open another route uh, from Stockholm uh, with about $75,000 uh, being donated by the joint for this particular program. Last example I want to give is um, uh, that um, uh, the JDC also uh, gave uh, almost half a million dollars to the International Committee of the Red Cross, which from 1943 became more assertive and more willing to, to help the Jews in Europe uh, for shipments from Geneva, but also from Istanbul, uh, for Theresienstadt and other, other places, which was possibly the largest amount donated uh, in two installments, so almost half a million uh, dollars. I was trying to, over the week, trying to be creative, and I made a map uh, which uh, uh, I mean, uh, trying to uh, show uh, what I was talking right now about um, on, 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 on the, uh, the visual, uh, visual health. Um, so those uh, green dots, uh, which are quite small now I see, are the places from where um, they were attempting to uh, send food uh, to the places of Europe, so Portugal, Lisbon, uh, Istanbul in Turkey, uh, Stockholm in Sweden, and then places in in Switzerland, Geneva, as the kind of humanitarian capital, and uh, Saint Gallen, which was the place where Sally Meyer uh, was, was based. And the, the red dots, um, which are fairly approximate, I admit, uh, are the places uh, that they were trying to, 
to reach. I put only one dot for the general government, uh, occupied Poland, because there were many more places than that one. Uh, the largest red dot is uh, Theresienstadt, which uh, arguably received the largest of where the, arguably the largest amount of food was sent, but also southern France, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, uh, back in Belzen at the end of the war, uh, just the uh, farther to the west, a dot in Germany, uh, and Sachsenhausen, and Lodz, uh, Auschwitz, Krakow, Lublin, and, and other places. So this is just kind of like an example uh, where uh, these uh, food parcel programs or that the uh, food parcel programs are trying to, to reach. It looks quite impressive on the map, uh, but at the same time, uh, it was clear, made, it was made clear from the very beginning by the Allies, by the British Americans, that this is just a symbolic concession. That, uh, that it was never allowed to reach a scale that could threaten the blockade, in the sense that if the Germans began really confiscate every single parcel, that they would seriously benefit from the whole program. And I have uh, this, um, this quote from uh, July 1944, uh, which is from uh, the uh, British Ministry of uh, Economic, Economic Warfare, which kind of makes it clear the attitude of the British. Uh, uh, remind ourselves that we are talking about the situation uh, in mid July 44, uh, soon after information about the Auschwitz protocols, the uh, escapees uh, from Auschwitz reached, uh, reached West. People know uh, what Auschwitz means, it had been before, but now it's a well known fact. But at the same time, the, the British clearly say that. Uh, this is clearly only possible to assist a small part of the great population in occupied Europe that is suffering. And I have no doubt that uh, whatever, that there are great numbers of Jews in every occupied country, as well as in Germany and their satellites, who are suffering grievously. With such limited funds, some must be chosen who may benefit, and others must wait with patience and the bravery for the day of liberation. So clearly, this is uh, kind of, uh, it is in a way a uh, gesture to allow uh, the Jewish communities to support some of the prisoners, uh, even if all the parcels really were received, which they were not. But, uh, but at the same time, it's made clear that the blockade is there and that they, will, they will, won't allow uh, the blockade to be compromised uh, in any way possible. And of course, it comes, it's not to be critical, it comes from the belief that the war is the priority and that this is the way to win the war. So, although um, kind of a clear achievement of uh, the, uh, the activists, uh, they also uh, had to face many complicated uh, conditions imposed by, by the Allies, and very often the, con the conditions uh, for, that allowed them to send money to Portugal, uh, Switzerland, and elsewhere were even contradictory. Uh, so, so the British uh, expected one thing, the Americans expected something else. I just want to give a few examples, uh, and that I, I make the point because it shows how important the daily work of few activists in, based in Lisbon, in London, in Geneva, Istanbul, was for the functioning of, this, of, this, of these programs. So the British, for example, they, they insisted uh, that the parcels had to be sent to individuals. Every single lot had to be an address of individual and the place where he or she was based, including the camps or ghettos specific address. Uh, this demand put uh, a lot of pressure on activists who had to compose a uh, uh, kind of long list of, uh, of uh, individuals all over Europe, and they kind of uh, benefited from cooperation of refugee organizations, of, of the exiled communities, who were of course sending the names of their family members, or their friends or relatives, etc. And however, the whole program uh, has to be confidential. So the British didn't allow any publication of information about the program. So on one hand, you had to compose all these uh, lists of names. At the same time, you couldn't publish in the news, for example, call for people, please send us the names of, the, of your relatives. Uh, second, ironically, the permission that the joint uh, received from the US Treasury stipulated that they could only send the parcels to recognized relief agencies, <laughs> agencies in occupied Poland, like in bulk shipments. And the liquidation of the Polish ghettos in 1942 uh, meant that uh, every single relief agency in occupied Poland was closed as well. It meant that the joint couldn't open the scheme of the program for Poland uh, until later, 
because they, there was no place they could send the parcels, because they were not allowed to send individual parcels. So it meant that, uh, that for almost a whole year, they couldn't send anything to Poland. Because they would be in breach of the license they received from the uh, US, US um, uh, Treasury. Uh, ironically, second time, the con this condition was removed from the uh, um, JDC license for the Czechoslovak uh, territory they received. However, uh, the uh, US legation in Lisbon insisted that before they allow the parcels to go, the joint has to always provide individual receipts for people that they receive the parcels. In 1943, which, uh, I mean, uh, there were some individuals who could communicate uh, from, uh, from uh, the uh, ghettos or from the residents that the outside world, but uh, it was impossible to promise that every single one of them would confirm the arrival of, of the parcel, because the, the, it, was, it was impossible uh, to, to achieve that. So it took five months before the uh, US legation in Lisbon stopped insisting on this uh, condition, and the joint could finally send food, uh, food parcels to Terezi in Chargetto in October 1943. So I just cannot give an example of uh, problems that um, they had to had to deal with uh, when they wanted to send uh, the, uh, the food parcels. So the, uh, the question is about the destination of, uh, of these, uh, these parcels. Uh, I, uh, this is a final report, which uh, is not the best quality, but is the only example I could find in the archives. Uh, it's a final balance of uh, food parcels uh, sent by uh, the board of deputies together with the Polish government in exile uh, over 19, 1943. And between uh, February and September 1943, they sent uh, over 27,000 parcels uh, from Lisbon uh, to uh, occupied, uh, occupied Poland. Uh, I'm sure the number is, uh, is visible, yeah. This is the first half of the slide, over 27,000. Um, but, but the program, uh, half a kilo each. But the program started at the point when almost all the ghettos in occupied Poland were already liquidated. So almost none of the parcels could ever be delivered uh, to the addressees because uh, they were either moved to a different location or they were no uh, longer uh, alive. So the first uh, summary of deliveries uh, comes uh, from June 43, and uh, the board of deputies said that uh, from over 12,500, uh, the first batch sent, uh, only 925 confirmations uh, were received, so less than 10% of people can acknowledge the receipt of, which of course doesn't mean that uh, they did in the end uh, receive the uh, parcel, they could be coerced into uh, sending confirmation. And in fact, uh, over uh, almost 850, so almost 90% of the confirmation came from Jewish councils, so kind of uh, not of the, from the people who were supposed to receive them, but from the official representative authority in the ghettos, uh, almost all of them from Lodge, this much stuff. So the ghetto with uh, Chaim Romkowski as the elder. Um, and uh, Herbert Kaski, uh, the JDC representative in, in Lisbon, commented that this result, quote, leaves much to be desired, which uh, is a, an apt comment on on the, uh, on the uh, program. They were trying to then, in the following months, to send more parcels to those who acknowledged the receipt, but, but by September 43, they acknowledged that they, there's no way they could continue in this way because uh, it could never be delivered uh, to the recipients, and they admitted that, uh, that this part of the Polish program <coughs> failed. There were people who wanted to continue despite uh, the kind of problems. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Selik Brodetsky, the head of the Board of Deputy, a Zionist uh, head of the Board of Deputy of British Jewry, who was willing to take, quote, considerable risk in this uh, case to reach at least some of the deportees, uh, but uh, also the Allies uh, were insisting on confirmations, so they could not continue, uh, continue in this uh, particular uh, way of sending uh, food. But soon another option, uh, which uh, until today has remained uh, highly controversial in the history of the Holocaust, opened. And that was um, the, uh, a kind of uh, sending food uh, to uh, the Jewish aid office, Jewish uh, Unterstützungsstelle, uh, which functioned in occupied Krakow and uh, was, uh, was headed by, uh, by Michal or Michael Weikert, who was a famous uh, Yiddish uh, theater uh, 
uh, writer, uh, scholar, author, and uh, social worker. And was one of the main um, social workers in occupied Poland during the whole uh, war. But as I mentioned, the whole history of the use, I will use uh, use as, as, as the, uh, the acronym, is highly controversial because already during the war, Weikert was accused of collaboration with the Nazis uh, and uh, of kind of uh, creating this office uh, which helped them to kind of uh, mask the real extent of the Holocaust, showing that uh, aid organizations were still functioning in occupied uh, Poland. In fact, uh, the youth was uh, allowed to reopen its office in March 1943, exactly at the point when the war, so, uh, sorry, the Krakow ghetto was being liquidated. Uh, and he functioned uh, until mid-1944, uh, when uh, Weikert went into hiding and um, managed to survive. survive. He survived the war, although already during the war, uh, the Polish Jewish underground uh, uh, issued an order uh, for execution of, of Weikert as, as, as collaborator. Uh, but uh, despite uh, these uh, warnings that were regularly sent to Lisbon and to London about Weikert, the Joint and um, the um, uh, Board of Deputies uh, kept sending uh, parcels to uh, to Weikert and clearly uh, quite a significant number of them was delivered uh, to Krakow and to Weikert. Um, at one point the Joint was willing to send up to 10,000 parcels a month uh, to Krakow in uh, late 43, early 44, um, or even twice a month. Uh, despite the fact they were aware that a lot of those parcels were being confiscated by, by the Germans. Uh, in the end, uh, there are no, I haven't been able to find a number of the parcels sent to Weikert, but it goes over 40,000, about 20 tons of food that was sent. The question is what happened uh, with, the, with the aid. Uh, it's clear that the majority was confiscated by the Germans. There was no doubt about it. At the same time, we know uh, from uh, survivor testimonies that, um, that some uh, not insignificant number of uh, parcels was delivered uh, to, to Weikert, uh, who either distributed them to uh, Plashov camp, uh, which kind of we know from, from Schindler's List film or book, uh, and, uh, or that uh, Weikert was selling the uh, kind of quite precious cargo, like sardines at the time, uh, at the black market and was buying flour and other basic necessities, which he was distributing to labor camps uh, over uh, around, around uh, Krakow, uh, Krakow uh, region. So there's no clear answer to uh, who was Weikert, uh, if he was a collaborator, if he was somebody who, thanks to his contacts with Germans, managed to save uh, lives uh, in, the, in the ghettos and, uh, or in the camps at the time. And they kind of shows uh, the gray zone of, uh, of aid under the Nazis. If people who wanted to help um, and wanted to receive significant help had to at the same time compromise themselves uh, with, uh, uh, by cooperating with the Germans, uh, I have no judgment. Uh, I don't know how to judge the Weikert in, in, this, in this way. What happened to him? Uh, what happened to him? Uh, he uh, was put on trial after the war. Uh, he, he was uh, acquitted by the Polish court, which led the Polish community uh, to create the social court, honor, honor court, uh, to uh, judge him uh, for the breach of kind of behavior in the Jewish community. And he was uh, sentenced by, by, by that court. I'm not sure if he was sentenced to, he was excommunicated from community or something like that. I mean, there was not like a legal court. He wouldn't, couldn't be sent to prison, uh, but he could be excommunicated from the community, or uh, he wasn't allowed to uh, hold any position of power. He ended up in Israel. In 1958, he, uh, he emigrated to, to Israel, to Poland. But he was essentially shunned, I believe, for the rest of his life. By <laughs> I know, I think his son then tried to you know, rehabilitate. Yeah, I mean, he published a long memoir about four volumes of, uh, in Yiddish uh, in the 1960s. So he kind of, he wasn't sent to, to prison or something like that. Right? He, was, he was not, but he lived out the rest of his life as a sort of... Sure, of course, yeah. Of yeah. Figure, so. Thanks, sort of. Uh, so this, this is one example uh, of the uh, of uh, occupied Poland and, and parcels uh, sent uh, there. Uh, the, the other... Uh, Parcel schemes or programs, uh, I believe, were uh, more uh, 
successful, uh, especially the uh, Czech uh, Czechoslovak program in cooperation with uh, the Joint Distribution uh, Committee, uh, which initially started uh, in March 1943 uh, for uh, Czech Jews in Theresienstadt and other places. Uh, and um, then uh, about um, uh, half a year later, the joint, uh, uh, the JDC joined the program and for sending also uh, food parcels to the residents. Uh, eventually, the joint uh, JDC was sending up to 18,000 parcels a month to the residents to 8,000 people. And in total, both the Czech and the JDC programs sent. Um, 210,000 uh, parcels uh, from Lisbon and, uh, to Theresienstadt over a year and a half, which is one and a half, 105 tons of food, um, mostly uh, sardines, but also dried fruit and, and biscuits and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, some other shipments to Theresienstadt went also from Sari Meyer in Switzerland and from uh, from uh, Turkey or from Sweden. Uh, another part of the program uh, the, of the Czech government and of uh, the JDC uh, went to Birkenau, Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was the second largest destination for the Czech program. Uh, it was much smaller uh, than the number of uh, food or parcels sent to uh, Theresienstadt by Czechs. Uh, in the end, um, almost 12,500 parcels were sent from Lisbon by Czechs to to Auschwitz uh, Birkenau, which is six and a half tons of food, uh, another 10,000 approximately by the JDC. Uh, only a few uh, indirect confirmations were ever received, uh, of prisoners that, that, that they did receive. One of them was the one that I mentioned at the beginning of, of my talk, Helen Konio, uh, who does mention the parcels also in her memoirs, uh, which were also so it was probably her daughter's memoirs. I'm not entirely sure. It was published around 2000. So probably her daughter's memoirs published around uh, the year 2000. Uh, another part of the JDC uh, program was trying to send food to Bergen Belsen, uh, about 1,200 from Lisbon, and uh, then Sally Meyer, about 5,000 a month, uh, with the help of the Red Cross. Again, uh, we will never know how many of those parcels to Theresienstadt or Birkenau where were delivered. I mean, there's no way to establish. Uh, some historians, historians uh, estimated around 15%, uh, which would be a reasonably high number, uh, given the circumstances. But to be honest, I don't think that you can give any, uh, any estimate in this context, also because uh, uh, it seemed to me that those historians were working with com completely different estimates of parcels being sent. And now, after my stay <laughs> in the JDC archives, I could say that much more was sent than the people had thought previously. Um, so if, uh, if there was a higher delivery rate, which, which is, in the end, uh, possible for Theresienstadt, uh, the reason um, stems from the role Theresienstadt played in the Nazi propaganda as this kind of model ghetto or spa town for elderly uh, Jews that uh, are allowed to uh, continue their lives, uh, uh, you know, uh, as uh, the uh, Nazis were, were uh, saying, as in the town given to them by the Führer. Uh, uh, also, uh, in uh, June 1944, uh, the uh, commission or committee or delegation of uh, the international Red Cross visited uh, Theresienstadt, uh, was guided through the town with the ghetto uh, by uh, the SS commandant of uh, the camp. And uh, for example, they were uh, led, the committee from the delegation was led to the local post office where they could see uh, the prisoners receiving parcels. So it was part of the, of the game uh, to show uh, that the Jews are allowed to live in the city and are allowed to receive help from, uh, from, the, uh, from abroad. And uh, some Anecdotal testimony uh, says that uh, the number of parcels received uh, by prisoners increased shortly before the uh, visit of the Red Cross in the town. Uh, also, uh, the Nazis, uh, with the help of Czech film crew, were preparing a film about uh, the life in the Theresienstadt. Uh, although the film as such didn't survive, there was apparently a scene uh, shot uh, in the film uh, or, shot, or sequence from the post office uh, where the inmates were receiving parcels and later a family scene in which prisoner opened a parcel he had received a brought and shared all the goodness with, with all his 
uh, family members or friends. Uh, we don't have much evidence also from the uh, German archives, um, and so that doesn't help much. Uh, there are some documents uh, signed by uh, Adolf Eichmann, uh, which allow, uh, in which he allowed the delivery of parcels to the Reichenstadt officially. Uh, but at the same time, um, the Jewish elders uh, were forced to send a letter to Switzerland thanking for the parcels, but stating that uh, no further shipments were necessary as the Jews in the ghetto had a sufficient access to food. So again, with, uh, German documentation doesn't help much in this context. Uh, even less is not about Beer Canal, although it is quite clear that almost none of the parcels uh, were delivered or distributed to, uh, to prisoners in Auschwitz. Uh, and that most of the kind of um, consigned or most of the parcels were confiscated by the SS and kind of distributed it among themselves. Although at the same time we know about prisoners who did receive some of the parcels. So even there, uh, it was under certain conditions uh, possible to receive parcels. Of course, then they were asked, for example, to confirm the receipt and ask for more, and which they didn't get. Uh, so it was kind of to show confirmation that the, the parcels were being received by the prisoners to and who ask for more, and which they, in the end, uh, didn't, didn't get. So uh, I'm getting to conclusion, because uh, I, I know that uh, uh, we're running out of time. So it's clear, uh, comparatively, yeah, so I'll get to this side. I went a bit ahead, but it doesn't matter. Um, comparatively, uh, the program constituted one of the smaller efforts of the JDC in its very long history, and uh, I wouldn't uh, deny that. Uh, and which dwarfs in comparison with the other programs before the war or for the post war reconstruction of the Jewish world, and which continues until uh, all the efforts that continue uh, until uh, today. Uh, even then, uh, the JDC contributed more to the program than uh, the rest of the organizations and governments I, I discussed, uh, more, more than all of them combined, uh, which uh, shows the commitment on the side of the uh, JDC. Actually, I, I didn't plan to, but I can, in the very first slide, I, I use a quote, uh, which is fairly small, I apologize, by Joseph J. Schwartz from December 1943, uh, who said that uh, uh, it still gets mobilizing the American Jewish community to send uh, money for relief purposes, to continue with the relief programs for the Jews in the Nazi Europe. That uh, we can't say that uh, it's the end of them and that we still need to try to reach every single one of them we can. So I, I thought this an example of thinking on the side of the activists who are trying to help during the war. Uh, Back to earlier, back. Um, there is something unusual about the whole operation. Uh, we have reasonable estimates about uh, the number of parcels sent during the war from in the framework of these programs, but we don't know how many arrived and or how many people received help, and we will never know how many people were saved uh, by this by this uh, uh, by these relief programs because uh, it was only one factor to be helped. And the evidence is always purely anecdotal. So it is possibly one of the reasons why, uh, why uh, this, uh, pro these programs remain in the shadow of other uh, larger rescue operations uh, during the war. But I believe that um, it, the program testified to immense efforts of a uh, few activists who negotiated and lobbied the governments and then did a lot of uh, underground work uh, preparing uh, the parcels and send them from Lisbon or other places uh, to ghettos of uh, Eastern Europe. And we should not forget about uh, these, uh, all these efforts. And we know that for prisoners, uh, it was more than just uh, food. It was uh, more than, than just the food uh, or the temporarily increased intake of calories that counted. They provided the parcels when they arrived. They provided uh, moral, moral encouragement. <coughs> it evoked the feeling that somebody cares. That somebody uh, in this whole world of destruction, somebody is trying to help uh, the Jewish people. So Rabbi Leo Beck, uh, in the picture, a uh, German Jewish leader, recalled that, I quote, a package came for me not long after I arrived in the Reservenstadt. Its contents had been removed, and it was really only an empty cardboard box. But it gave me joy in the knowledge that someone had thought of me in exile. 
for uh, Miriam Wattenberg of Mary Berg, uh, later known in Warsaw, the arrival of a parcel from her friends signified that, quote, in this ocean of misery in which we are living, it is a comfort to find a warm-hearted person. And Ruth Bondi, a uh, Czech Israeli writer, famous writer, remembered a similar feeling in Birkenau uh, in, uh, when in uh, February 1944 she received a parcel with a loaf of bread. But the sole realization is that it was addressed with her name and not simply to the prisoner number tattooed on her forearm yeah. recreated the feeling of human dignity in her forehead. But others um, paint, uh, this by the way, confirmation sent by Leo Beck that he received parcel from uh, Istanbul, which was used for the exhibition, I believe, you mentioned, Linda mentioned before. Uh, other paint a more um, kind of a less positive image, uh, and acknowledge uh, the social problems uh, the parcels caused in the community, especially that they created a social divide between those who received parcels and those who did not receive parcels. So there were people who had access, and, and uh, um, Hans Günther Adler, who is the, um, he's the main historian of Theresien in Ghetto, is very critical of the relations between among the prisoners and the ghetto. Uh, he uh, uh, asserted or suggested that the very few of those who received the parcels were able to share uh, with, uh, with uh, prisoners, which is something uh, uh, another historian recently uh, tells about the Danish Jewish community who had uh, received the most parcels uh, from the Danish Red Cross in Theresienstadt, and that there was a lot of fighting whether they should share it with the rest of the community or if it was only for the Danish Jewish community. And this is a, a, a painting from, from Theresienstadt, uh, which again shows the divide uh, that uh, the Sulasovis market. Uh, there was a special permission that some or only selected prisoners received, which they could send to their relatives outside of the ghetto, uh, who could use the stamp or the uh, um, not stamp, the post stamp, post stamp to ship them food. Parts. So it was uh, permitted in this way. If you, send, if you received outside of the ghetto the uh, post stamp, they could use it and send food parts. But only a few of them received the uh, permission. And then, uh, kind of, uh, this social divide between those who could receive parcels and those uh, who did not receive uh, is uh, evident in this uh, in this in this uh, satirical uh, painting uh, by by. Uh, sorry, I didn't use so the uh, the it's in the Leo Beck con uh, collection. I forgot the name of the author. Is author about hundred similar uh, paintings. So and so uh, in uh, Leo Beck. Um, two final two minutes uh, to conclude uh, some last thoughts. Uh, some, some authors believe that the claim that the parcels could have saved lives is absurd. But I believe that the parcels, when they arrived, helped the prisoners. Although the Nazis intended to murder all of Europe's Jews, uh, they also, for uh, various reasons, allowed some parcels to reach, uh, to, to reach prisoners, and I kind of uh, gave some examples before. In the end, the Nazis benefited from the program as well by confiscating the, uh, the rest, or also in terms of uh, propaganda, or at least they thought so. Uh, but the physical and um, psychological support uh, the parcels brought to the community could help some uh, to survive until the day of liberation. And let me conclude with one final example. Um, in November 1945, uh, Ines uh, Re Regina Gerke uh, was 67 uh, years old at that time uh, in the dis displaced persons camp uh, Degendorf in Bavaria, contacted her brother Walter Rothschild uh, in Los Angeles. I quote, my dear brother Walter, now that I am again pretty well taken care of, the memory of the starvation period in Theresienstadt and the indescribable blessing caused by the sardine packages are very vivid in my mind. I don't know whom I have to thank for this humanitarian gesture. Should you, my dear Walter, have the possibility, please do it for me and emphasize the fact that innumerable fellow sufferers would have been reduced to real starvation were it not for the generosity of these contributions. In spite of all postal difficulties, the dispatches were perfectly well packed, and we were all happy and moved by the regularity of their arrival. Your loving sister, Ines. 
Uh, the letter was for, for, forwarded to the JDC office in New York with the attached comment. I'm sending you this German letter, as I'm sure you enjoy hearing how the work of your organization is appreciated. What is the date of the... Uh, it's uh, November 1945. What? It's after the war. Oh, it's after the war. She survived. She survived. She's a displaced person again. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, that's all. Dr. Lenicek, we're um, looking forward to seeing um, the book that you're working on. What's the um, name of the book? <laughs> um, we have uh, about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, yes. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. It was really fascinating um, and courageous. So I know these, this data is pretty depressing. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just confused about um, um, the, the regulations uh, requiring that the packages had to go to individuals. Was that a condition from the Allied governments? It wasn't the Nazi. Okay. Uh, I, I think that it was from the, uh, it depends in this case, was on top of the British government. And I guess the intention was that uh, it has to be really good specific individuals. Uh, and, and there was also a long, lot of uh, debate uh, inside of the Jewish organization. What's better, to send it individually or as a group shipment? Because it was easier to send the group shipment uh, and it was uh, easier to trace it. At the same time, if they send individual parcels, it created a personal connection so that they could send it to individual and the individual knew that uh, it was others directed to him or to her. Right, but if you were in the Warsaw Ghetto, it was very hard to get packages mm. through. And the other thing is, is that did these packages, for instance, from Portugal, were they going by air or rail? Because rail. By rail? Mm. Because the Nazis really controlled, you know, the airway, I mean, the air. And the and, and it, and it was official, it, it arrived at the post office. It wasn't like a clandestine. It was official, official post parcel. It was uh -huh. stamped, and post stamp and everything paid for, for delivery. So it was sent as official uh, package. Um, to, um, the, just one last thing. By any chance, do you know who the Prime Minister was at this time that was allowing packages to go from England to, uh, to Portugal? To, to Churchill. Um, well, from England, they sent money from England. Uh, uh -huh. It was uh, Winston Churchill. It was Winston Churchill. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. Um, okay, I, I think you may have addressed this, but just a, a very broad, basic uh, question. I, I think it's, it's sort of shocking that uh, any of these parcels would have reached the ghettos, Jews in the ghettos, and especially in, in the camps. Um, was this again part of this whole fraud, you know, a, a attempt at defrauding uh, of the world? Again, the, the propaganda, uh, you know, that you that you spoke of certainly, you know, in terms of Theresienstadt. But uh, it's it's a, it's a difficult question. But, uh, but we know that uh, for a long time the, the Nazis allowed uh, the joint to function in Warsaw Ghetto um, until like, uh, the, the first years of the war, the official soup kitchen, the official right. kitchens run by the JDC, right. while with the money from, from JDC. And then, uh, for example, if you read the notes by Emmanuel Ringelblum, he mentions parcels coming from, from all over the place. Right. I mean, it's just something that people do, and, uh, and uh, I guess uh, they just, uh, and, and some, uh, there was something, uh, some regulation from 1943 that the, the Jews in the Gedeal of the Mount were not allowed to receive passes anymore. There was nothing official published, if I'm not, not wrong. Uh, but uh, <laughs> not, not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, not all of them. There's still, I mean, there's still get large ghetto is still sure. in existence. So, so, yeah. Um, so that was that was one question. Um, also, um, you spoke about Beichert mm. and, and again his. Uh, his dealings, right? I'm, because I'm doing research that pertains to uh, Juden, Juden, uh, well, particular Judenrat and, and mm -hmm. the Jewish administration in a particular place in Poland. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just curious if you've seen uh, in, in what you've researched um, other situations where, where uh, parcels were misappropriated by uh, 
again, Jewish administration, whether the members of the Judenrat or Jewish police uh, in, in particular ghettos? Uh, I, I don't know. I admit, uh, I would probably look at Lodge. Uh, yeah, because uh, there was I know there was. I know about, but, I, I, for, but I'm not looking at large. Mm. I mean, I'm looking at a smaller place. I mean, not uh, Warsaw, it, not it, Warsaw. It, it, it is something that, that comes from the whole situation. I mean, everybody's starving. Right. You know, and everybody's trying to get extra food if they can. So why would the situation with Brussels was different uh, if they could steal it? Uh, some people? And this, again, uh, steal is not the right word in this context. Misappropriate. That's <laughs> So, so you don't know specific? Uh, no, sorry. I mean, the, 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 the point, Michael was the only one who was allowed to function from 1943 onwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you for your great presentation. The picture that you have, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, mm -hmm. I think you should note that those pictures were from probably the SS and were staged. Mm -hmm. So when you see the smiling faces, it's not just some not sure. uh, not candid sure. uh, photograph. Uh, that's number one. And number two, about the work of Laura Margolis mm. and her efforts in the Far East. You didn't really discuss that in Shanghai. Uh, I, I focus on Europe. So I, I, uh, I mean, there's there was, there was also a lot of help reaching uh, the Jews in Soviet Union, uh, deported also, uh, exactly. uh, from, from the joint. But uh, I'm really focusing on, on Europe in this context. I guess another book. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's other people who write about this stuff, I think. Very, uh... Give them a chance, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you a question here. Thanks very much for a wonderful talk. Um, my question is related to how did they determine what was in the, in the parcels? I can understand that um, sardines and nuts are high protein, the oil, maybe the sardines because they came from Portugal, but what about uh, coming from mm -hmm. Istanbul and, and, mm -hmm. and Geneva and such? Mm -hmm. were, were there any discussions amongst nutritionists? At the, were there any nutritionists at the time? <laughs> 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 what, what type of food should, I, should be not sent? Sure. That, that's a very, very good question because it was usually only the items that were allowed to be exported. Uh, so, so in Portugal, Portugal, for example, at the beginning of 1943, Portugal uh, prohibited any export of food, and then they changed it and allowed sardines, uh, pine nuts, or dried fruit as the only items that could be sent. That's why the sardines. Also, they could have to compare. Uh, I mean, those who are sending the parcels have to compare uh, the, the weight, but also the nutritional value and the price, and what's the best combination to put in the parcel to be economic, but also to, to to help. From Switzerland, they also sent condensed milk and um, stuff like that, which, uh, which again, I mean, it, it is uh, by some really ironic, but uh, it was something that, that, uh, that uh, the Germans also wanted. Because uh, very often the items that are sent to the ghettos, uh, as ironic as it sounds, were something that the Germans themselves couldn't access, or the Germans. Uh, which which uh, also kind of uh, uh, is something that could be considered as a factor why some of the classes are confiscated. Because there's a story from Vienna, I believe, that there was a, a train carriage uh, at the train station and uh, with the direction of Theresia and stuff with food. And then the Viennese people were complaining, how come the Jews again are getting all the stuff from Switzerland? You know, and we are here suffering uh, under the war conditions. So uh, it's just something that's also documented. Yes, you, you mentioned the half a million dollars went through the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. I know we all have negative opinions about the Red Cross, but <laughs> but um, the thing is, did they have more of a success rate than that 15%? Was it less likely that the Nazis would confiscate it if it went through the Red Cross? Yeah, uh, I, I, it's, it's very difficult to tell. I mean, and then there's no like a, a list of arrival, like a, what was received, what was not. Uh, I would say the difference uh, in the Red Cross was uh, that, uh, again, they sent uh, bulk shipments, like uh, uh, train loads, like uh, carriages, and uh, it probably was more difficult to kind of confiscate the whole carriage. So uh, one, one uh, Czech historian uh, believes that, for example, once they sent two train carriages uh, and the Germans allowed one to go to the residential and one they confiscated. Uh, again, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's very anecdotal evidence. Very often, there's no like confirmation. And even if you have confirmation sent by the 
Jewish elders. I mean, what does it mean? I mean, do they receive the, uh, the parcels? We don't know. Uh, you asked about what kind of things they sent to the ghetto, sir, Mr. Moshe. Uh, here in a letter that my parents uh, received from the Warsaw ghetto on October the 9th, 1941. Yeah, no, I'm going to tell you. Uh, we received a half a kilo of cacao, a half a kilo of coffee, half a kilo of cacao with vanilla, and the cinnamon really paid off. We pulled out 250 zloty for one decagram. Those are the kind of things that they sent. But that was in 1941. This I was in 1941. When you mentioned the condensed milk, mm. I remember, I'm a second generation, so I've heard a lot from relatives that uh, I remember my aunt worked in the kitchen for the Nazis, and they used to call her Krumpli Roji. Roji is the name, and Krumpli means potatoes, because she used to steal potatoes and stick it in her apron. She was also a seamstress, so she knew how to sew in little pockets to hide potatoes in. And she used to bring them raw potatoes at the end of the day. But the milk, was for the Nazis. Mm -hmm. It was not going to the people. No, so that's the way I know it. Sure, so when I mean, you I mean, mentioned the milk, I said, but they didn't get it. The I mean, Nazis got the milk. I mean, uh, again, uh, I think that, uh, that it could be, uh, that in case of the residential, that some of the milk was, was delivered. Uh, but I would say that most of it was definitely confiscated by, by the Nazis. I mean, uh, Therese is, is, is a specific case in, in this context. It's completely different to Warsaw, to, to Krakow. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, if you'd like, you can peruse some of the literature in the back, sign up for our e-newsletter, um, and sign up to receive uh, notices about programs such as this. Thank you.